So this video is just going to introduce the basic principles of retrosynthetic analysis. So retrosynthetic analysis is a method for planning syntheses of molecules. Um, and it's a paper exercise, it's theoretical. So we break them down on paper until we get to commercially available starting materials. And what we then do is reverse the route and actually perform it in the lab. So a retrosynthesis focuses on the target molecule. That's the molecule you're trying to make, you're trying to synthesize. And you use these retrosynthesis arrows here to break this target molecule down into its starting materials. Um, so in this case, this arrow is sort of saying that molecule A can be made from B and C, or at least we think it can be made from B and C. Until we try it in the lab, we won't know. Uh, if either B or C aren't commercially available, in other words, you can't buy them from a chemical supplier, you're going to need to um, break them down further. So using more retrosynthesis arrows, you can break down these intermediates until you eventually end up with um, starting materials that are commercially available. So in this synthesis here, we're saying that C, F and G we can buy from chemical suppliers, but all of these intermediates here you can't, so we're going to have to make them. So that's our retrosynthetic route, that's our plan for our synthesis. But obviously a synthesis runs forward. So um, we're going to start with our synthetic route from the starting material at the end of the chain, so that's G, and we think that we can convert G into E uh, using a specified set of reagents and conditions, which you would include. Notice this is now a reaction arrow, it's not a retrosynthetic arrow. And we think that by treating E with F and some reagents and conditions, we can make D, and so on and so forth, until we end up with our target molecule. So you can see that the retrosynthetic route focuses on the target molecule and breaks it down into starting materials, but obviously when you then do the synthetic route in the lab, you're going to start with your starting materials and hopefully synthesize your target molecule. So what you would then do is go into the lab and see if the synthetic route that you've planned actually works. If not, you can always go back and you can replan your retrosynthetic route. You can change the steps that didn't work, you can swap steps around and that sort of thing. Um, and that's part of the sort of strategy of um, synthetic chemistry. So every step in your retrosynthetic analysis is either going to be what we call a disconnection or a functional group into conversion or FGI. So if we look at all the steps that we've got in this retrosynthesis we can see some of them are disconnections and some of them are FGIs. Now, disconnections are the reverse of a clear carbon-carbon or carbon heteroatom bond-forming reaction. So all of these processes theoretically break the molecule into two or more parts. So you can see A has been disconnected into molecules B and C. We've sort of broken it into two discrete parts. So when you're drawing this actually on a, a retrosynthetic diagram, the specific bond to be disconnected is indicated on the structure. And you usually use these wiggly lines uh, like this. So what we're saying is that we're disconnecting this bond here, and by putting in a retrosynthesis arrow, we're breaking it down to the starting materials, uh, in this case an acid and an alcohol. So basically what this is saying is that this molecule here can be formed from these two starting materials, and this is the bond that we're going to form in that reaction. Okay? So remember, a disconnection is a, is a theoretical idea. When you're actually doing the reaction, that's the bond that you're forming. So the starting materials for that reaction go after the arrow. Um, quite often what chemists will do is they'll label the disconnection, uh, either with the type of reaction it is, so this is a 1-2 substitution reaction, or they might give it a name, for example over the arrow, this is a Fischer esterification. Um, just to add a little bit more information to the retrosynthetic plan so that the reader can see exactly what they're, they're proposing to do in this step. A functional group into conversion as the name suggests, converts a functional group into another. Now, this is not to say that bonds aren't formed or broken in functional group into conversions, um, but we often use FGIs for redox processes or where a disconnection would be unclear or confusing. So, for example, here, this functional group into conversion, uh, we're basically conceptually disconnecting, if you like, an alkene back to an alkyne. Um, if we were to draw this as a disconnection, it looks a bit weird uh, because we've got two hydrogens in here. These are the hydrogens that we're adding in this reaction. This is the reduction of an alkyne to an alkene. Um, it's needlessly complex, right? This is a redox process, so we can say it's a functional group into conversion. Uh, we're reducing this alkyne to this alkene. Similarly, another redox process, so we're, we're saying that we're making this ketone from this alcohol, so that's an oxidation process. Um, if you were to draw that as a disconnection, 
it, it looks odd and it's also technically incorrect because you're not actually disconnecting both of those bonds, right? You're only forming a pi bond in that reaction. So we tend not to put these disconnection arrows on, uh, sorry, the disconnection uh, wiggly lines on uh, because it's, it's unclear or it's confusing. So for these sort of steps, you just put FGI over the arrow um, and then you can see what functional group has been converted into which, which one. So the rule is that basically both disconnections and FGIs must correspond to a known reliable chemical reaction. So we can't just disconnect any bonds because if you think about it, if the forward reaction doesn't exist, how would you do that in the lab? So if we take this molecule here as an example, this is a reliable disconnection. Okay, that's the disconnection that we've just seen on the previous example. So we know that we can disconnect an ester back to a carboxylic acid and an alcohol because that's Fischer esterification. So that is a known reliable chemical reaction. If we take the same molecule and we decide that we want to disconnect over here, uh, what chemical reactions do we know that can form a carbon-carbon bond in a benzene ring? Um, Probably not many. Uh, so that's not a reliable disconnection. So you have to think about when I'm disconnecting or doing a functional group into conversion, does the corresponding forward reaction actually exist? So retrosynthetic analysis is being constantly updated by advancements in synth synthetic chemistry, right? We are we're dealing with the toolkit of modern synthetic chemistry. So all the reactions that we've invented to date. So for example, this disconnection. Uh, if the disconnection approach existed in the 1900s, uh, this disconnection wouldn't be a reliable one because there was no chemistry that was known that could really form uh, this type of bond. But nowadays, it is a reliable disconnection um, because we've invented Suzuki cross-coupling. So it's constantly being updated, but you have to look at what reactions currently exist um, for, for disconnections like this. So, for example, in the future, Someone may well invent a reaction which forms this bond, but for the time being, it doesn't exist. So you've got to look at the current toolkit that you've got available to you. So to summarise, the basic principles are we identify the functional groups in our target molecule because all chemical reactivity is driven in some way by the functional groups. Um, so if we look at this molecule here, we would identify that there's a phenol in it and that there's an amide over here and so on and think, right, how can we make amides and phenols, right? That's somewhere to start with your, your retrosynthetic analysis. We disconnect or do functional group into conversions with known reliable reactions in mind. So I'm going to disconnect here. That corresponds to an acylation reaction. That gets us back to this amine intermediate. We repeat as necessary until we find commercially available starting materials. Now, in this case, both of these are actually commercially available. This is paracetamol. But <laughs> just as a, as a demonstration, let's say that this wasn't commercially available. You would have to disconnect or FGI it until it was. So let's do a functional group into conversion. Right, That's the reduction of a nitro group into an amine. Um, and let's do a disconnection here. That's electrophilic aromatic nitration. And that gets us back to phenol, which we know is commercially available. We then write out the forward synthetic route. We add reagents and conditions, but remember we start from the starting materials and we end up at the target molecule now. So starting with phenol, uh, we can treat that with nitric acid and sulfuric acid to nitrate it. Uh, we can reduce the nitro group with uh, hydrogen and palladium on carbon, and then we can isolate it with an acid chloride uh, and a weak base. We can then go into the lab and we can try this route out. And if it works, great. You know, your, your plan has, has worked as planned, and that's wonderful. Uh, if it doesn't, so this step here, for instance, let's say that we get some cross-reactivity between these two groups, then we can go back and we can replan our retrosynthesis to, to take into account the, the successes or failures in the laboratory. So that's basically the idea behind retrosynthetic analysis. It's an on-paper theoretical exercise which allows you to plan uh, synthetic routes, which you can then obviously go and, and carry out in the lab.